please tell me how start the stories of the Erasmus, where and how. <laughs> the real story, I suppose, is that uh, with another colleague, uh, we were having a pint of beer in the uh, in a pub just around the corner, uh, out out of work hours, of course, <laughs> and. Uh, uh, on the back of an envelope, I sketched the idea which I'd really uh, taken from my experience at the University of Sussex. So I wrote the idea in, in one sentence to promote joint programs of study between universities and other institutions of higher education. The, how brave you were during the 80s to rely on a network of university and on, on member states. Perhaps because I'm former UN, and I know that uh, as a, a former officials, you have to be brave for doing something like this. But that I think is the future of Europe, you know, to go and uh, dismantle barriers, <coughs> which are quite old-fashioned, and rely on the civil societies. And that uh, I, I I perceive this uh, as the real heart of all the Rasmus stories. Am I wrong? Uh, obviously, we had to have negotiations with the member state authorities. Uh, but the key from the outset was to give responsibility directly to the universities. I had been 12 years working at the University of Sussex before that. And I knew very well that the question of university autonomy, uh, the universities taking decisions about the admission of students, about the degree qualifications, uh, about the quality of the teaching, these were for the universities. If the universities couldn't be directly engaged, there would never be the confidence, the mutual confidence and trust to build. And that's why I'm very happy looking back now that we had this 10-year period of a large-scale pilot where we could gain the confidence of the academic community and the student community to know that they would support the fully-fledged Erasmus program. And in fact, it was, it was widely applauded at the time. And soon after that, it was very interesting, we were able to negotiate the introduction into the treaty, a legal basis for educational cooperation, which meant that the financing from the European Union could be secured as well, because there would be a legal basis. And you know, we, we didn't have any serious opposition to having that legal basis established. And we wouldn't have had that support without the Erasmus dynamic, because it was the scale of Erasmus that caught people's imagination. Exactly. And the crucial point was, it had to be officially recognized as such, so that what I dreamt of was that if you got a degree, you would have a, a piece of paper when you left, showing explicitly that the qualification was secured by agreement between the two or three universities involved, and that the future employer would see this, and it would be a crucial additional element in the curriculum vitae of the student. That was the exciting thing. Fantastic. And I, I've seen many examples now, and you must have seen more than I have, yeah of places recruiting people, deliberately looking for ex-Erasmus students. Yeah, absolutely. No, no, when, when we speak with headhunters, when we speak with private corporates, so they say, well, we look at, often they say, we look at if they did Erasmus or no. Some headhunters told, told us, uh, if an Erasmus center, if a former Erasmus center and knock on our door, we see from his face. Yeah. Well, I don't know if it's like this, but it's definitely something that change, uh, change uh, uh, our life. Well, it, I think this business of changing the life and uh, attitudes uh, and experience, and it's the, I think it's given a sense of excitement, yeah. additional excitement to the student experience, which lasts a long time. Absolutely, because it, uh, we are registering on our Checking Europe, uh, we are registering some comments, some tweeting from uh, people that did Erasmus in the 90s, and they uh -huh. say, I cry as a child to get in touch with the Erasmus community. There is a, probably one of the strongest sense of belonging 
definitely yeah. in Europe, I yes. think. And that's why we wanted to transform this energy into sustainable economic growth, in, in where people and professionals help each other at different levels. Very good. And uh, that's, uh, that's our scope. I think that's very exciting, uh, what you're trying to do. And particularly in these difficult times, exactly. uh, economically difficult and very challenging with the globalization hitting everybody in perhaps unpredictable ways, uh, to, to, to create the energy so that people are everywhere are calling now for more entrepreneurial effort. Uh, and this is part of it. And this can be not the only answer, but it can be an engine in the overall effort, I think.